education for technical needs, kind of like dropping in technical talent on critical issues quickly and efficiently um, to respond to our rising needs. Um, how do you think about the services that USDR provides? And perhaps you can also describe one of your favorite projects in USDR and how such projects progress so you can get a flavor of how, how stuff gets done in your organization. Sure. And also you, you neglected, maybe everyone already knows, but you neglected to say that Levy was also a huge part of the USCR team. Um, I really honestly do not know where we would have gotten without him. Um, so just wanted to shout out Levy's work and Ola as well. And I think actually several members of SPC. So it's great. Um, let's see. So as I mentioned, like we started off as a pretty I mean, we've been very scrappy the whole time, but I would say we were definitely focused on this idea of rapid response. So everything that we did came in typically through a government team, a partner, someone in government reaching out for help. And so they would come in and say, literally it was like, hey, we need to figure out how to update our city on the latest shelter in place guidelines. And you know, is it, we need some help updating the website or we you know we've been posting on Facebook. We don't think anyone is seeing our latest updates. Um, so it could be something like that that looked more like a pretty short task. We could put some volunteers on it to things like, we have senior citizens that are stuck at home and can't get food. Like, do you have any ideas on how we can help them, right? So we had a wide range of problems. Some would be very like kind of website focused or communication. Sometimes it was IT. Um, another great example very early on was the city of Napa. Um, their own office had to go remote and they were like, we don't know how to work from home. Like, do you have someone who can help advise us how to set up a VPN or introduce us to some online collaboration tools? And that's what we did for them. So we've had things that look like communications, IT. We had, and then we also had these more open-ended questions that come out of the, the thing, like basically the unprecedented strain that the crisis is putting on a lot of government teams. Um, if I had to summarize, like it's changed. If you ask me every week, it kind of changes a little bit. But if I had to say themes of things we've seen, I would say the first wave of, of things that we've helped with were really around um, that idea of communication and just everyone wrapping their heads around what does COVID mean for me and my city and my state and my county. Um, and that looks a lot like, you know, content, um, like content, translation, design, a lot of things like that. There's a really big wave around healthcare. So we did a lot of projects around helping um, counties or states or cities build better dashboards on uh, the status of their PPE, their, their personal protective equipment, ventilators, hospital bed capacity. Um, we actually, our volunteer team got a really nice letter from Mayor uh, Bill de Blasio in New York City that was just literally like written like, thank you USDR volunteers for helping us build this dashboard that helped us understand where we were on PPE and, and hospital beds. Um, so we've done a lot with, with healthcare related things, um, kind of looked into contact tracing and applications. Um, but a big category of things that you've probably read about in the news uh, are benefits. So right now it's basically an unprecedented um, kind of economic hit in terms of people losing their jobs and losing wages. Uh, I was just reading the news this morning. And I think it's like the 10th or at least 10th, maybe even 15th or more uh, straight week of over a million people applying for unemployment. So basically these are record numbers. And unsurprisingly, a lot of government systems were not built to take that kind of load. Um, so imagine you have an old software system built decades ago that's used to seeing like 5,000 applications maybe every few months, and they get 50,000 applications in like one day or in one hour, um, and they're just not meant to scale. Um, so there's already that, but then also with the CARES Act and a lot of other things that are, that are good, they're injecting stimulus funds into the economy, all of these things need to be implemented. So you have old crafty system, and then you also have like new policy trying to be layered on top. So we do a lot of work in benefits and just kind of the overall social safety net, all kinds of benefits. I joke that I call them like all the P's because they all start with pandemic. So there's pandemic paycheck protection, there's pandemic unemployment assistance, there's pandemic like food stamps, everything starts with P. Um, but if you name it, we've probably had some volunteer helping some state on either making more sense of this kind of um, benefits application or even just helping them scale the systems. So for example, in Kansas, we had some volunteers who um, help them bring the website back up because literally their Department of Labor website was just crashing because so many people were trying to apply for unemployment. Um, I'm trying to think, I think some recent things that have been, um, you know, it's weird to say exciting, but they're exciting to help on. They're really 
scary problems, but one area is, is food security. I think a lot of people are live in food deserts, have limited access to fresh food. Um, and so we've been doing work to figure out how to build tools and services that, you know, help solve that problem locally. So to answer Levy's questions, one of my favorite projects, and there are many, but this one I love for a variety of reasons, is in one county in, um, in Texas, in Bear County. Um, we, fun fact was we actually got referred to this uh, woman who works in, in the government from her husband, who also works in government, who we had been helping with a different project. So he was like telling his wife at home, she was having this big problem of, we have all these food producers that are willing to actually sell food at low cost, like low cost produce, but we don't know how to get the word out. We can't figure out how to like connect this, pro this produce supplier with families who actually need food. So he was like, hey, have you heard of US Digital Response? Maybe they can like build some tool for you. Um, so in come the volunteers, they build this, you know, kind of very modern, like hackathon project cell tool that's you know, open source, it's a React app. Um, it uses Stripe to accept payments. Uh, and they basically built it. And we jokingly called it like our own kind of open source, like Shopify for local food pro produce, um, produce suppliers. And we launched it in, in, in Texas. And then literally within the next few weeks, we had so many other places that came to us with the exact same problem. So at this point, this one tool has been customized and scaled to DC. It's been scaled in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, another county in, in Texas started using it. And I think for those of you who've played with those tools, it's like pretty remarkable that nothing is that complicated, but just putting it together, making it free and available for government teams and local nonprofits um, is having a really big impact on families. So in DC, when that launched, um, 1,400 families signed up for um, CSA deliveries in the first day that the site went live. Um, and, all of it, and all of it built by volunteers. Yeah, sorry, that was a long spiel. The last thing is that it's very close to my heart and I just came out of a show and tell where someone was presenting about this. We're trying to do something with elections. Um, I think giving people, the, I think the right to vote is so fundamental to our democracy, but also just, administering elections is really hard in the time of COVID. So we are doing projects like, um, I just saw a demo of this where we're trying to help redesign the envelopes because um, depending on how carefully you fill out a vote by mail ballot, your vote can actually be like not counted if you don't fill it out right. So we're trying to improve the design and working with a nonprofit organization that does that. And then we're also trying to help recruit poll workers because without poll workers, you're gonna have really long wait times and people just won't be able to vote. Um, so those are some examples in elections, but uh, there are many more and I'll stop talking because I could go on for probably like an hour on <laughs> just projects. No, that's great. I mean, it's kind of amazing the breadth and depth of um, uh, volunteer projects that you know the USDR engages with. And um, maybe skipping ahead a little bit actually, you know, uh, I do have a question around that, which is, you know, it's, you know, you have Napa Valley on the one hand and you have like New York City on the other. And uh, it's hard to imagine like, you know, how can you like fulfill the needs of this like very sophisticated, you know, metropolitan city, and then this kind of, you know, small, uh, you know, uh, outskirt, you know, out in California, uh, that's drinking a bunch of wine sometimes. And, um, um, you know, so how do you kind of maintain focus across these different governments localities and these like, you know, very divergent uh, needs as, a, as an organization? Yeah, I don't think, so in some ways we're not focused, right? Like, because our role is if people reach out for help, we'll try to find a way to help them. It ends up expanding our scope pretty broadly. Um, so I would say we're not that focused in the sense of like the subjects. What we've invested more in, it's in props to, to Levy and the tools team, is we try to invest more in like having really clear kind of internal processes. So one example is um, every shape of, or just a few things, every request might look pretty different. So like, helping city of Napa go digital versus, you know, dashboard for New York city, very, very different types of work. So we built this internal job board where we do this intake process and we actually try to codify like, what is the vol what is the project looking for from a volunteer skill set? So in one case, it will actually say we can use someone who has like experience at like networking systems or Cisco or kind of professional like uh, IT sort of services for a few hours to consult a city. And on the other extreme, it's like, okay, we need someone who really knows how to build dashboards and understands data infrastructure for 10 to 20 hours a week for a month, right? And you can tell like those recs are like very, very different. So we try to codify all that and kind of put it into our like sourcing process and interview process for volunteers. And all of the center piece is like, we try to really standardize and make it streamlined. 
um, but the end results, like the end projects and the volunteers can look very different from each other. Um, now that we have a few months under our belt, we are starting to get, I think, I think more sophisticated in seeing trends. So now we can save time when we're like, hey, this request looks a lot like this other thing we did. And that's how this project, um, the food, the produce project I, uh, I referred to, we call it Storefront. And that's how Storefront has been able to grow and kind of scale the different cities is now we kind of all know like, hey, Storefront does X, Y, Z. So when we get a new request in, we can kind of very quickly match it to like an existing team of volunteers um, or even like an existing tool that we've already built. Um, I remember like th there used to be a lot of conversations about being reactive versus kind of proactive for government needs where it kind of felt in the beginning, you know, governments were coming to us with all sorts of, you know, things that were popping up. And as you mentioned, like there were themes like throughout the months, like, okay, this is the most important thing now. Um, and then, you know, we were kind of tr uh, trying to change, um, uh, uh, trying to change things a bit to be a bit more proactive and try to, you know, guess at what, you know, governments will need, like, uh, you know, moving forward. How, do, how did that dynamic kind of play out and how's it playing out now? Yeah, I think guessing is really hard. Um, and, and I think actually having talked to a bunch of other COVID response efforts, and especially more tech ones where there have been hackathons or kind of people building tools. I think um, one thing that has been so special about our work is we tend to be partner led. So we looked back and we saw that like most of our most successful projects were ones that we had the partner from day one and we kind of knew there was a real need. There's been a few exceptions to that. I think one is that we have some amazing, I forgot to say that the team is actually maybe less than 50-50 now, but certainly in the beginning, it was like 50-50 government experienced people and then like non-government experienced like tech people. Mm -hmm. And the people with experience in government, they just know how government works. They anticipate these problems in a way that you know I, I couldn't. Um, and so when we've had areas that I would say a government like vet is like, this is gonna be a problem, we should do something about it. Those projects have also worked out really well. Um, and I, I think the reason for that is it's kind of like a proxy, right? We sort of have a local person on the team who can actually kind of like be in the shoes of a, of a potential partner. So in that case, we have done a little bit of building ahead where we've thought, okay, this is gonna be a problem. Let's try to build something that might be useful, but then very quickly we like look for a partner. Um, so to make that really concrete, one example um, of that is, uh, is um, this is very like wonky. It's very like only if you work in government kind of thing. But in order to get stimulus funds from the government, from the federal government as a state, you have to apply for all this paperwork, right? There's the CARES grant, which is, you know, trillions of dollars, but there's a lot of minutia around. You have to like file the paperwork. You have to check all the requirements. The federal um, um, government has to approve your grants. And this all takes a bunch of time. And you would think it'd just be like a very basic CRM, but people do this manually. So this is an example of we built a tool for people to do this. And we're like, I think people are gonna need this because the CARES Act is coming and it's gonna be a lot of money and a lot of paperwork. So let's just build the tool and see if anyone will wanna use it. Um, and that project has been really successful. At this point, like multiple states are using it and cities and so forth. Um, and then the other example is elections. I don't think we would have just randomly tried to help on elections but one of our team members was a former secretary of state. Um, and that's basically her wheelhouse. And so more than anyone else, she really knows what it looks like to administer elections. And so she very early on was like, this is gonna create problems. I know this field, let's try to do something. And then we proactively kind of went into the space. Um, I think one last like thing that I, I'm really glad we do is we really try to never like reinvent the wheel or kind of start from scratch. So with elections, the number one thing we did, the first step was actually like reach out to existing nonprofits um, that already do election access and voting access. And we just said, hey, we know you're super swamped. Like, could you benefit from having some support? So like the envelope redesign project, like that's an existing nonprofit. They are awesome. I think it's called Civic Design Service, um, but they're just, they're just short staffed. So we were just like, here, have some volunteers to help make your existing work go faster. Um, and that's also something we try to do a lot of. Wonderful. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and um, talk a little bit about the timeline of the USDR, uh, as well as the time, timeline for the pandemic. Um, you know, everything in this past few months has, has been, you know, squished up together and like, you know, decades have been happening in weeks. Um, and uh, definitely like when I joined the USDR, I kind of felt, you know, that there was an incredible amount taking uh, place. 
So I just, I just want to remind everybody that, you know, um, the pandemic is pretty new. Uh, you know, it started, the, the first uh, case of local transmission started in, in uh, January. Uh, Trump, President Trump uh, declared a national emergency March 13th, around the time that the USDR was being founded. Um, and, you know, by the end of March, we had local transmission in 50 states, you know, and, and we're still like very much in the midst of the pandemic. You know, there's 154,000 people that have uh, died from the virus. There's, you know, 4.5 million confirmed cases. And so, you know, this is really a tragedy on a historic scale and it's still unfolding as we speak. Um, if, we, if we, re we rewind the clock a little bit to early March when USDR was being founded, it wasn't like that obvious that, you know, we're gonna be in such a gruesome situation. So um, I want to ask you, you know, can you kind of walk us through the first couple of weeks of like, you know, that led to like founding the US Digital Response and like, you know, why do it in the first place? And what, what was the gap that you, that you identified, you know, that was not being serviced by other organizations? Yeah, so I'll claim that my, so I'll tell the story of USDR and just share that my personal story is a little bit different in that, um, I had just finished a fellowship, had no immediate career plans. Um, and so I was sitting at home, like reading the news, like many of us, and was just like, what is happening with the world? Like, can I be helpful in any way? So that was my mindset. I did not like do organizational analysis or like see what was out there or anything like that. I was just literally sitting at home being like, how can I be helpful? Um, the other three co-founders of U.S. Digital Response were all former U.S. deputy CTOs. One of them is actually the founder of Code for America. Um, and all three of them were formative in helping form U.S. Digital Service, which is the federal like tech team. Um, and I think at least one or two of them worked on healthcare.gov. So I would say all three of them came in with a lot of knowledge around what does it look like to build technology in a crisis? What is the role of technology in government? So they had already known each other uh, and I had just happened to know a few of them. And I actually don't know, I should ask them why they called me, but uh, Jen Palka, the founder of Code for America, just literally like emailed me and called me and was like, hey, what are you up to? Like, do you wanna like help volunteer in this thing? And I was like, sure, right? So that's how I got pulled in and we all came together and the thesis was like, knowing what they knew of healthcare.gov and just how government technology works. The thesis was, can we get volunteers to help? Because we're guessing that government teams are overwhelmed. That was it, that was the guess. And what happened was, I would just say literally every day that I've been doing this, it's just been like, so I've learned something new or it's kind of just revalidated the fact that there's something useful to be done. And I, I think that's, what's just, that's just what's kept us going. But I think even in that first week, we saw like thousands, I think within the first two or three weeks, we had like two or 3,000 people sign up to volunteer. It was just, just mind blowing. Um, and today we have like closer to 6,000. So you can tell it was a huge rush in the beginning, of course. So we had thousands of people sign up. And then on the other side, they emailed a bunch of their personal contacts. So former colleagues um, from the White House era, but also just in local and state government. And they were emailed them and were like, if we had some tech volunteers, could you use help? And we had a lot of demand, right? So I think once the two sides connected, uh, we've just kind of never stopped. Like every day there's been something coming in or something that we could have more volunteer support on. Um, and that's kind of really informed us and we just kept going. Um, the other thing I think that's been quite a journey, I actually had this daily diary, I have this like long, just like notes doc on my, on my Mac that just has like little notes from like, every day that I was working uh, on USDR of just something I found interesting and unusual. Um, in some ways it's slowed down now, maybe not every day I have something, but like kind of looking at it and it's like, I think those first few weeks, there was just for me so much like mind blowing revelation around just how the government works and all the challenges that people are facing. Um, and that I think has, that I would say happens to every volunteer. Um, they have their own journey of they like, if you're new to government, they come in, they start volunteering and they're like, what, this is how it works. And like, this, this is what I, I need to do. Um, and I think that's also fueled kind of USDR overall is that the, the, the um, what did they say that? Like the beginner's eyes or something, but you know, it's like people come in and they sort of see something new and mm -hmm. it really hooks them and it's very infectious. So I get reinvigorated by the new volunteers who come in every week. Um, uh, one of the things, uh, uh, so when I came in, I came in like, I think in the beginning of April and there were, I, I, uh, 
uh, I helped out on the tools team, so I had access to the Slack admin features. So I pulled on, I pulled a little bit of stats, and I hope it's okay if I share some of them, Raylene. Yeah, so, no. uh, When I came in early April, there were about 100 active people on Slack. Um, and then, you know, a month before that, there were like five. And then a month after, after I joined, there were like 250 or 300 people. Um, and, uh, you know, basically this organization grew to like a Series B company in the course of like two and a half, like three months. Um, and it definitely felt like we were all kind of, and maybe people still are like hanging on, you know, to dear life and just kind of like, you know, uh, uh, as though it's a rocket ship. Um, how did you manage that blitz scaling? Like, how did you make sure that things didn't just like fly off the wheel and like, you know, uh, we, the organization wasn't lost in like, you know, the hodgepodge of just like growth? Um, yeah. I'm, I don't miss those days, <laughs> at least. I'm, th I'm thinking back to the first couple of months. It's stabilized a bit more now, which is nice. Um, yeah, I mean, you were there too. I think every, like, certainly week, if not day, we would just be trying to make something more efficient. Like, the job board I described, it's probably in its, like, fifth incarnation of just exactly what to put, how to manage it, who has access to what. Um, so you, you think about every, like, any aspect of what we do, that process has been, like, pretty well thought out, like actually I should say has been iterated on a lot and we're thoughtful about that. Um, and so we've invested a lot in like tools, asynchronous communication. Um, we try to learn a lot from mistakes. So I think, I guess I would just say it actually looked, it felt very reminiscent of like work, my work in some ways at like Stripe or Facebook, but it was just like super compressed. Um, and so we would be doing things in like a month that maybe you would normally do like if you're scaling out a team over like a year or half a year. Um, the other benefit was, and Levy himself included, the core team had a bunch of people who have actually a, quite a lot of experience like managing teams and scaling teams. So I think we all kind of came into it being like, okay, we have a playbook here. Let's just try to like implement it like very, very quickly. Um, and so I feel like we were often just speaking the same language. Like uh, we have this, this woman who's awesome, her name's Emily. She's just like the process czar. Like every day she'd be like, okay guys, time to like change your annotations or we're gonna change this. And you can imagine in some rooms you'd be like, oh God, like I'll get to that next week. You know, you can imagine in companies it's always like that, like set up your 2FA and it's like a month later you've done it. But in USDR, I think people got that the tools were important and the process was important. So like that day or, you know, that week, everyone would, would happily, maybe ha happily, but they would at least come together and everyone would kind of cut over. Um, and that's really kept us going. I think it has, now it feels, um, it doesn't feel that different in a way, but we don't have to, our model is a little more fixed now because we kind of understand that we have volunteers and we have projects and we have partners. But even in the beginning, that was hard too, where we were just like, is this a project? Is this like, should we do this or not? those things have settled in, but we continue to, we we're actually just talking this morning about like groups of volunteers, like how should we think about access groups or like different names. Um, and I think that we would just keep doing that like every day, every week. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I also found that there was like a very common language that we all spoke in terms of like growing and participating in the organization and that there was a lot that we could safely assume, you know, about how like things need to get done. Um, that made everything flow a lot easier. Um, so we talked a lot about kind of the internals, you know, and the machine of the USDR. I wanted to kind of bubble up a little bit and talk about, you know, um, the, the clients of the USDR, you know, the governments. And, um, and um, uh, let me try this question on and, and, and see what you think. You know, when people think of Silicon Valley and government, it's a little bit like oil and water, like it doesn't mix that well. And, uh, and, you know, in addition to that, you know, uh, Silicon Valley, for example, rewards and celebrates, celebrates risk taking or government, you know, is typically very risk averse and trying to minimize risk and kind of play by the book. And then there's, of course, kind of the ongoing scrutiny of Silicon Valley and big tech. You know, there was just a uh, uh, there was just a uh, Senate hearing about the role of of big of big tech, you know, the power it wields and elections and things like that. Um, and, you know, and there seems to be like kind of mountain distrust of, of like tech influence, you know, in those spaces. Uh, has this at all affected, you know, the USDR's uh, ability to get its job done, uh, you know, win over the trust of, uh, of governments? Um, and uh, how, do they, how do those dynamics play out? 
Yeah, I think the theme kind of goes a little back to our model where we're invited in for the most part. So I think that changes a lot of things, right? So we're not, we're not knocking on doors. We're not trying to sell anyone anything. Um, also, I should say, because it's all volunteers, it's 100% free. Um, and so we actually get around a lot of government restrictions around, like, it's actually really hard for governments to engage vendors. Like, there's a long, lengthy process. And when it's free, you can actually invite people in and, like, have them help much faster. So you kind of get around certain paperwork things. Um, so part of it's we're invited in. So it's somewhat of a self-selecting audience. Um, they're kind of eager to get help, and they, you know, they want to hear what we have to say, and, and we're there to help. I think the other thing is we really don't emphasize, like, we're not really like technology first responders or we are first, we are technology first responders, but we're not really technology first, like people. Like we usually come in and we're like, what's the problem? Like, let's listen, let's think about tools that already exist. Um, and I think that also helps. Uh, one example I thought was, was really funny is like uh, one of our partners, they were trying to figure out, you know, how to scale out their call centers because they're all really being slammed right now, especially on the benefits. Um, and they're like, you know, we heard like, maybe we should be using AI to like kind of automatically route calls, like answer calls. What do you guys think? Like, should we be using AI? And, um, someone on our team wrote back, this is Alex, just like a long email. It's like, okay, first of all, like AI has its place, but just so you know, here are like eight tips to scale your, your, your call centers that require zero AI, you know, things are like implement metrics, like check on your scripts. Like they were just like really basic things. Um, and I would say that is more typical of the stuff we do. Like we tend to just more think about like the operations and the communication and design. And we don't really say like, you should use this fancy tech tool. Um, that's kind of like the last thing on our list. I think it helps for sure. Um, sorry. Um, let's see here. Uh, we have, I think time for a couple, one more, one or two more questions. Um, has uh, has the COVID work or has the need for USDR uh, kind of gone down, uh, has died down in any sense? Or have governments been able to kind of, you know, has governments been able to figure out some of the technical or technical needs or is the is the need stronger than ever and like, you know, and uh, in, in, in still growing? I think it's changed. I, I don't think it's died down um, overall because I think what we've realized is, or we've seen is that while some things were kind of the acute COVID crisis in a way, like healthcare related, as I mentioned, there are a lot of things that are just like longstanding systems or government services that are affected and also will keep being affected for a long time. Um, so I think there's no shortage of things that are popping up. Like for example, uh, we have some projects going on with courts right now. So courts, I think are gonna be materially changed for a while. Like you just can't have the get 200 people in a room for jury selection process work right now. Um, and so that's an example where that comes in and we see that and like, I think there will be things like that that'll continue to come for quite a while around workplace digitization and other services um, that aren't COVID specific, but are bioaffected. That's part of it. I think the other one is um, there are a lot of, uh, local government teams in the country. And we've worked with a very small number, all things considered, and we kind of just keep get, getting connected to new teams. And like, sometimes it's it's something they've been dying to do for years, and now they have some help to do it. And sometimes it's another COVID crisis related emergency. So I just think there's kind of a lot of people out there that could use this help. Um, so that's, I think we'll keep going. And, and I think also the, the biggest thing that powers everything we do is the volunteers. So. You know, I say as long as the volunteers keep showing up to want to help, then I think we should find a way to get help, get the help out there. Um, so I think as long as those two things stay true, we'll like keep going. Um, do you think like the experience, so, so, so I know some of the government partners were kind of amazed at the experience of like having, you know, volunteers drop in and then get results immediately, where usually they would expect, no, this would take years or, you know, months and something is accomplished like within a week. And this kind of this experience of reset of expectations, like, no, this is actually what, you know, really good technologists are able to do, uh, you know, when you engage them. Um, uh, do you think that, that that is like changing a lot of hearts and minds in terms of like government's expectations of like, 
you know, uh, how they can engage with like technologists and technology? Or is this kind of more of like, well, that was nice. Let's go back to, you know, the way that we were doing things. I mean, I hope it's the former. Uh, and that's kind of our dream. We have a we have these um, this woman who's actually I mentioned her earlier. She's a former Secretary of State, um, so she's been a, an elected official. She's working government a long time. She's amazing, and she, that's like she says that all the time. She's like, "We're here to change hearts and minds." Like everyone, um, I, I, my optimistic view is I think we are, even not in every case, but in a lot of cases, I think that if we can leave them with like a tool or a practice, um, and often they they love it. They're like, "What is this tool? Like we've never seen this before. Or this way of doing like." a sprint or brainstorming or like using Airtable or even just using Google Sheets better. Like these are things that seem small, but they do kind of click in, in people's minds. Um, and I think that creates a lasting effect. So I do think there's a mindset shift. There's also a lot of things happening that feel to me like one way doors. So, you know, if you take a form and you make it like you get rid of the need for a wet signature, there's no way, there's no reason to go back the other way. Right. So I think we're kind of like helping a lot of cities go through a one way door. Um, which is, which is, which is great. Um, and I think one, one funny, like changing hearts and minds, we'll see, we'll see if this kind of thing lasts, but a really funny story, or I thought it was funny and a little sad was we worked with, um, one city to help them like digitize a, a flow they had. And we put on a slide where like, oh, and the price of this is, it was five zero zero dot zero zero per month. We're like, here's the price and we'll set it up for you and like walk away. And it's all off the shelf software. And they were like looking at it and like, this is great. And they asked, is that $500 a month, a month or $500,000 a month? <laughs> and I remember everyone was just like laughing because we we're like, how could you think this was $500,000 a month? It was like, I think I literally remember it was, I think it was like a, a couple tools in like either Google or it was like basically a very standard like off the shelf tools. But that's an example where my hope is like the light bulb went off and they were like, wait, software can be cheap. You know, and then from then on, hopefully it kind of changes their purchasing behaviors. Um, I'd love to, uh, I'd love to keep going, but I also want to open up a little bit to discussion uh, and, and questions. And, and let me, uh, there's a few questions posted in Slack. So let's start up, st let's start up with uh, those questions. Um, so Ben, Ben was asking uh, if you can explain a little bit, a little bit about the ecosystem that the USDR fits in. You know, there's like other organizations that we already spoke about, like, you know, Code for America, the US Digital Service. Um, you know, how is the USDR different? You know, how does it fit in? Um, and how does it fit in? Yeah. Yeah, so they're all, and I, I won't claim to know all of them that well. Um, sorry, I'm getting to know them a few months in, but um, so they're all kind of different if you look at like either the, truthfully is the structure. So like, where does it sit? Um, so is it a government agency or not? Uh, what is the, uh, um, how do they get paid? You know, what's the financial model? Like some, for example, USDS is actually a federal government agency. So they are funded out of um, a federal department. So it's appropriations. They basically get money, you know, when, as part of Congress, right? So uh, Congress approves how much money they get. So that's a very different example than like um, a company called Ad Hoc, which is actually a public benefit corporation, but it's more like a vendor. So they get paid to do projects for governments. Um, so those are some examples. Um, Code for America, I think, is a is a nonprofit organization that primarily. Oh, there's also size of government, so federal, state, local. USDS primarily does federal. Code for America primarily does state and local. So you can kind of see the matrix and like where different organizations fit in. I think we are still trying to figure out exactly where we fit in. The sweet spot, or kind of the spot that I think is not as well served or wasn't as well served before is what I described, this like very short-term rapid response work where we come in and it's not just advice, we might also build something. Um, there weren't many other organizations doing that because they're not really set up to do that. And, and also we just are very fortunate to have volunteers who can do that kind of stuff. Um, so that's where we started. And I think we're also focused more on state and local, um, actually almost exclusively on state and local um, because those are the people we talk to and we find like could use the most help. So that's where we're living. I think like over time, we'll kind of see what makes sense to do. Um, the other thing is the ecosystem overall is very underfunded. So if you think of like, I don't know, I remember someone was telling me, it's like, I think in aggregate, if you think of philanthropy dollars and you think of like digital service teams, like I would guess, like I think at the federal level, 
no more isn't it's probably way less than like a hundred million dollars go towards um all of the digital like the digital service teams and that seems like a lot of money but i think if you look at government spending it's a very very small amount and similar similarly with philanthropy like very little money actually goes to um civic public interest technology compared to like larger causes um like education or social safety net and so forth so even though there is a matrix and maybe people are overlapping. I think the general consensus is um, there's not enough people doing this work. So more people doing the work is kind of always a good thing. Wonderful. Um, does anybody want to jump in with questions? I don't think there's many of us, so we can kind of go popcorn style. Uh, no worries, because I have a bunch of questions. Go ahead, Ben. Can you um, talk a little bit more, Raylene, maybe using some examples from previous projects about the workflow end to end? And I'm sure it's going to be different for every project. And you did mention a little bit, um, but can you walk us through what that looks like? It's like someone reaches out to you, you organize a team, there's back and forth, there's a, you bring in partnerships, but yeah, maybe a little bit more explicit about what the beginning to end workflow looks has, has looked like for some of these projects. Sure. Um, so I'll just give you the typical one. Basically, it usually starts with uh, intake or like a partner that kind of we get connected to. So either they reach out or we're referred to them or something. So you have a partner, they come in, usually they have a problem. So they'll say, we would love help to solve this type of problem or to kind of build this type of tool. Um, we'll we now have kind of a team that's kind of um, sort of specializes in like intake and like working with partners up front. So they usually get on a call. They'll just get on a call, ask them what's going on, uh, and try to take a lot of notes and come out of it with some plan. And often the plan would look like the kind of JDs that I described. It might take a little more back and forth, actually, where we might, you know, bring in someone who's already leading a project that's very similar to the request, and we'll do other things. But a simple view is like at some point it kind of makes it into like a breakdown of what we think the work will look like. Um, and it, it literally could be like, this could use one designer and two front end engineers or whatever it is. And then we like put that into our queue of like job requests uh, for volunteers. Um, and then the volunteers team, they're amazing. They basically, their whole thing is they look through those job requests, they search through our database of volunteers and they like interview them. So they reach out, they schedule the interviews. Um, that's it, we onboard the volunteers and then normally we then connect them back with the partner. So depends on the timing. Sometimes it can happen in days, sometimes like a week, but we try to be really fast. So very typical requests, like let's say the New York City dashboard, it's, it literally was like, we could use some help building a dashboard. We like go find some data people and then we connect them back up and then they just start working with the partner directly. Yeah, Yad? Um, Raylene, this is awesome. I, I've heard a, a lot of things from uh, Levy, how, how you folks went about it. and. Um, so Levy mentioned something about uh, how fast the team grew. Um, so I think obviously there's a lot of there's a lot of questions around like how you can do that. But um, the question here that I'm interested in is uh, what what did you have to do when like when there are things actually don't work out when you have like five people working on something and you're like okay we're two weeks in and nothing is happening especially in the case where these are volunteers like what's like how does that conversation go? Yeah, we, and I should say, it's not all roses. We've seen bad, like not bad example, but like things that could have gone better and like everything you can imagine. So we've had cases where we like hustle and we get a volunteer team together and then the partner basically ghosts. <laughs> they don't respond for a while. And we're like, do they not need help anymore? They like try reaching out. We've also had cases where the volunteers for whatever reason can no longer, well, no longer keep volunteering and they, they may kind of disappear for a while. So we've seen all of these, um, and we've also, we've also seen a couple projects where we start doing something, we actually build something, and then we realize later on, it's like, I don't know that this is actually useful. Like this tool doesn't seem to be working. It doesn't seem to be solving the original problem that was phrased. So we've had all these cases. I would say, big thing is, I think we're really lucky that our volunteer community is like overall really like communicative, understanding, humble. We have this oath that's that we publish that basically like hammers all of this out. Like, please only do this if you're willing to kind of accept that, you know, partners may have needs that change. You're humble, you're communicative. So luckily it's usually not too hard of a conversation and our volunteers, if it's gone wrong in some way, they usually raise it too. They're like, hey, 
I've been ready, ready to work, but the partner hasn't gone back to me, like what's going on. Um, and then we have people on the team, like people who we kind of use as like backstop roles, like myself or a lot of people on the government's team, they'll actually go and try to reach out to the partner and like talk to them and see what happened. So it kind of looks like any other thing where you have to have kind of a difficult conversation. Um, but because it's volunteers, it's usually relatively easy to, to close the project down, right? Because it's sort of like, hey, we were just volunteering here. So we're going to, we're going to close it down and we're going to stop working on it. Um, I think the more challenging ones have been figuring out what to do with projects that go on for a long time. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, they're good in that they keep going because they're useful and more, more governments come in and need the help, but they're also challenging because they're volunteers. So we had a couple of cases where we've had to try to like hand the baton off between like old and new volunteers. Um, and it, it's going okay, but there's always like a lull in the middle where it's like, you know, it's like, it's just like, imagine you're connecting like two volunteers to each other to like try to hand off a project. Um, so we've had to do that a few times too. One thing I'd love to add to that is an insight that Alex and Lane shared. Uh, uh, Alex hopefully will actually join SBC uh, at some point, we'll see. Uh, but his insight uh, about uh, volunteer organizations, especially USDR is that, you know, nobody's getting paid. Uh, you don't come to this organization to, uh, put it on your resume because nobody knows about the U.S. digital response. Like, you, and uh, if you don't like working there, you're not gonna work there. And so there's naturally this thing that it attracts the right kind of people, the people that work well together, the people that wanna contribute and the people that wanna do stuff. And it pushes away people that, you know, perhaps don't have, you know, values that necessarily align with the organization that, you know, wanna get paid, you know, wanna get famous or something like that. And, um, and so that makes, that allows, you know, the organization to interview people with 30 minutes, say, yeah, okay, come in. And then, you know, if it doesn't work out, it's okay. It's like, you know, no harm done. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, and it's only people that really, you know, that really kind of do uh, align with the organization that end up, you know, staying and, uh, and contributing. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? I promise that's it. Because this is really interesting, the part about you mentioned uh, doing the 30 minute interview. So the barrier is obviously really low when you say, look, I'm going to work for free, um, right? Like that I, in some way, you just have to follow this oath. Um, is there like, is there something that you would put in front of that person where that right away, I mean, other than the conversation, is there like some sort of a guideline where you can use as a standard when, um, I don't know, going on, like when I, I imagine these interviews keep going on. So is there like a version of this conversation that you folks have with the initial um, volunteers or someone who want to do whatever kind of building would be, uh, programming, data science or whatnot, um, that that right away kind of gives them the instant, real, instant realization that, okay, this is what's going to look like. And then it also gives you that, is there like a version of that? Yeah, I mean, I think, part of it is probably the interview itself. So there's like a script and there's certain things that people ask. And then there's the oath. Um, we actually also wrote um, a set of like, we kind of put them all in this, this uh, Git book, um, all of our policies. And there's also things like inclusion um, and a, a kind of more like, you know, creating a safe environment and security policies and data policies. So we have a bunch of those things too. And we just, it's sort of like required reading as you start off. So I think that definitely sets some of the tone. Um, but we also do a weekly onboarding that's a zoom call like just like this one and I try to make all of them but definitely like other members of the team who've been volunteering for a long time join uh, and so then that I think that also helps because everyone sort of shares like why they're there and then we go through the values again kind of live in a presentation. Um, anybody have any other questions? Oh, yeah, go ahead Aviv. Yeah, um, I'm curious sort of where you see this going, um, like, I guess for you personally and also for like the organization and for the model. And um, I'm, uh, I guess I have a follow up to that too, potentially, but I'll, I'll wait. Yeah, um, it's a timely question. It's kind of like my project for next month or I've been thinking about it continuously more or less. Um, yeah, I'm thinking a lot about where this goes. Um, we are, I think we realized pretty early on that the things that we're trying to do, the help that we're providing, isn't going to go away overnight. And so I think we started thinking like, what does it look, what would it look like to keep USDR going for like another year, right? Or another year and a half or however long. Um, so we've been thinking about that for a while and what that looks like. So both kind of like 
funding or structure and projects and do we you know um, just kind of think differently about how we staff projects um, I'd say it's a work in progress I wish I had more to say but I think a lot of people are really committed to keeping this going um, I think we've I think it's like been something special so I think a lot of people feel like we should keep it going uh, and I personally feel the same way and we um, I like I like the the spirit of everyone is it's very scrappy it is very iterative so We've also talked about running kind of experiments with with how we might want to structure things. So one that just went live, I'm super excited about it, is we are um, co-hosting or co-running, co I guess, a fellowship with the um, New York City Mayor's uh, CTO's office. That is an unpaid fellowship, but it's basically a co-branded like USDR plus the CTO's office. And we're going to we're kind of think of it as an experiment. You know, it will be a good experience for the people in it, but as it's kind of an organizational experiment and that we'll see how it goes. And maybe that's something we try to do more of. Um, yeah, and the idea of that is just uh, like, can we do maybe longer or deeper kind of uh, engagements with partners? Because um, in the end, we can do a lot in a couple weeks, but we can obviously do more in a couple months. Um, and so we're just trying to see how to like scale both like the ability for us to keep placing short projects, but also potentially the ability to support longer term projects. Um, Raylene, there's another question that came up that uh, actually I also had um, uh, coming from Tamina, which was, you know, could, could, could the USDR model ever work in other situations and contexts? Uh, I'm aware that, you know, there are, uh, the USDR has inspired other organizations in other countries. And maybe you can speak a little uh, to that. Yeah, and I, it's a great question. Um, so I'm kind of reading through. I mean, so I think one neat thing, and we were actually joking we should have like a, a mini conference or happy hour with the other like other countries' versions of USDRs, but there have been several. So one of our newest volunteers actually helped start a very similar effort for um, Ethiopia. I think I think where he's from. Um, it's funny because I don't think he physically was there, but he's like, I'm just back from helping set this up in Ethiopia. But I think he's physically been in the same place the whole time. Um, there's also another one in Mexico and we talked to them in the beginning when they were setting it up. There's another one in, I think, Argentina. There's several around the country that we've just, sorry, around the world that we've heard of. I'm sure there are many, many more. Um, so that's been really awesome. And um, wait, was that the question or are you asking if there were other ones that, yeah, yeah, um, uh, yeah. Were there other kind of organizations in other countries that kind of followed suit? And you know, do they are they kind of following a similar playbook to to the USDR? Yeah, I wish I knew more about it. I know when we met with them early on, it was it was the idea was similar, but some of the differences were kind of those same dimensions I mentioned. Like, is it within government or not? Um, what are the partners like? Like, is it kind of like people pre-apply to sort of get volunteers or is it more on demand like we do? So I think each of them have their own differences um, as a result. I think the Mexico one, one of them was actually, it looked more like our US digital service, like the federal agency where it was, I think part of it was actually a government agency. And they were like, we will do this alongside people in the private sector. So it's kind of a more explicit public private partnership um, oh, I'm, I'm blanking on the name, but I'm, I can't remember the American city. There is a city in the U.S. that did their own in the city, and it apparently worked really great, where in that city, the mayor was like, you know, tech team assemble and like tried to attract local tech talent, and they had their own version of it, too, and it was going really well. So I think there's actually a bunch of people doing this, um, and, and I, think, I think a lot of them are hopefully going really well, too. Wonderful. Cool. I'll go ahead of you. Yeah, so the, the follow-up, and it was these all sort of tie together, is so I see even within the US, there being other places where a similar model could be applied. And, I'm, and, it, and I feel like USDR is also probably long in the line of, of a series of things that people have tried to do, things sort of like this in different situations, different crises at different levels. And most of them have not been nearly as successful. Most of the crises have been less extreme. Most people who started them have been less experienced. Um, uh, but I, I guess I'm wondering, are there, is there any sort of thinking about, oh, we need to do this, maybe it needs to be a different organization, but to apply for this other domain. And, and, and in some sense, you're talking about elections, which is different from like health directly, but it still is supporting the government and things that they're trying to do. Um, but you can imagine there being like a couple of other, I guess, areas where 
you've got a different set of partners that you're working with. I know there's a little bit of nonprofit work, but yeah, I'm just trying to understand that. And I think about it specifically in the sense of right now, there's a real risk of like large scale unraveling of American democracy. Um, uh, and like thinking about ways to, to address that, which is sort of another crisis that um, is sort of happening in, in slow motion, but you know, would benefit from potentially from this sort of work. Yeah, and sorry, I was just reading Tamina's question too. I'm gonna to see if I can get to some parts of it. Um, I didn't cover as much. I think, uh, so I guess I'll kind of backpedal a little bit earlier and it was being slightly facetious about being focused. I think we are focused in the sense that we try to set these like guardrails to kind of just make sure we can actually do useful work. So it was sort of deliberate to say government partners like in the US. Yeah, yeah. No, there's, there are some nonprofit partners and like it's a right. little fuzzy. Um, but it's gotten more fun. So I think, but I think, um, so the short version is, I think we try to start really clearly with like COVID crisis response in the US government teams. But I agree that there's so many adjacent problems and just systemic issues and infrastructure problems that we often just get into anyway because our partners bring them to us, but also the people that volunteer with us are interested in them. So another example, um, actually I think a great example is um, part of all, all of the Black Lives um, Black Lives Matter um, protests, but just this whole, I think, good, great push for policing transparency and understanding the data and just how does policing work. That is recent and started after USDR started and in many ways is not a COVID crisis, right? But it is a crisis. And I think that came up and a lot of volunteers, myself included, we were like, how can we help, right? This feels really important. And structurally, there's something different in the sense that if there are tech problems, we could similarly deploy volunteers. So we did actually put a team on that in that we, um, a few things, we like tried to see if there were any existing nonprofit organizations um, that were working on related problems and um, offered them help. And then we also put together a little bit of a kind of outreach plan to um, both nonprofits and government agencies who were trying to make sense of their police budgets and increase data transparency in policing or increase um, transparency in data around people of color and the impact that COVID has had on those communities. So we did that and we've now sent out some feelers, we've worked with some partners and I think, I think we're actually working on a few projects in that. So that's an example where I think we do have opinions, like we are, we are not so rigid to the box and we think, hey, this is important, it's affecting our country and, and people in the same way. And also I think, I guess one thing, just responding to the last part of Tamina's question is like, I think what's interesting is, yes, it's US centric in a way, because we are helping people in the US, but a lot of the things people are working on, I think that's really touching for them is they're helping groups, often marginalized communities that a lot of us have no personal experience in. Um, so I think it's been a learning opportunity and, and a way to feel like, okay, let's try to support these communities that maybe aren't very underrepresented in technology normally. Um, so we had a volunteer today who was sharing a bunch of amazing research he did with um, small business owners in like a small state that I won't name because we try to not share things publicly, but he was like personally interviewing all of these small business owners in this small US state, um, very far away from where he lives. And he was just like, yeah, they were like telling me about their like shoe store and their barbershop and all these things that have all these problems. And um, I think it's very affecting. I think you really like kind of try to hear and listen and like, okay, what can technology do? But also understanding that they're not the normal audience for a lot of the work that we normally do in technology. Great, we have only one minute left and I wanted to close um, uh, with an, another question, uh, uh, but before that, uh, you know, working with the US, the US digital response was really amazing. Uh, working with Raylene was an incredible amount of fun and I hope we get to work together again. And the question is, um, if, if somebody wants to join, what do they do? Uh, right back at you, you Levy, and everything you just said. Um, yeah, very easy. You can ask Levy for sure. He'll point you the way. But um, on usdigitalresponse.org, there's a big button somewhere that says like sign up to volunteer. Um, and yeah, if you do that, just put in my name or Levy's name. We have like a referral box so that we can see like where you found us. Um, but do that for sure. And also you can email me personally if you just like were curious. Um, I'm just at Raylene at usdigitalresponse.org and you can send it out if, if there's notes or something. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty easy. Just like sign up and um, I think the best thing to do too is if you are really interested in particular topics or things to help on, just put it all in your application. Um, as you can imagine, people read those pretty carefully. Like we have very like fine grained people searching through that database. So 
if you are like, I would love to work on like this type of problem and I have this skill, um, put it in there. One disclaimer is that often projects are pretty demanding time-wise or can be. So typically we've had more luck placing volunteers who can kind of at least commit 10 hours a week um, or more uh, for some duration. Um, but occasionally we'll find short projects and, and we can still rope people in. Great. Uh, Raylene, thanks very much for uh, joining us for this uh, Q&A. And uh, thank you for all the work you're doing with your yesterday's digital response, and especially all the volunteers that are making uh, a positive uh, change in the world. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And nice to meet some new people. Okay. Bye. Bye, everybody.